The Kith of the Elf Folk Chapter 1 The north wind was blowing, and red and golden the last days of autumn were streaming hence. Solemn and cold over the marshes arose the evening. It became very still. Then the last pigeon went home to the trees on the dry land in the distance, whose shapes already had taken upon themselves a mystery in the haze. Then all was still again. As the light faded and the haze deepened, mystery crept nearer from every side. Then the green plover came in crying, and all alighted. And again it became still, save when one of the plover arose and flew a little way uttering the cry of the waste, and hushed and silent became the earth, expecting the first star. Then the duck came in, and the widgeon, company by company, and all the light of day faded out of the sky, saving one red band of light. Across the light appeared, black and huge, the wings of a flock of geese beating up wind to the marshes. These two went down among the rushes. Then the stars appeared and shone in the stillness, and there was silence in the great spaces of the night. Suddenly the bells of the cathedral in the marshes broke out, calling to even song. Eight centuries ago, on the edge of the marsh, men had built the huge cathedral, or it may have been seven centuries ago, or perhaps nine. It was all one to the wild things. So even song was held, and candles lighted, and the lights through the windows shone red and green in the water, and the sound of the organ went roaring over the marshes. But from the deep and perilous places, edged with bright mosses, the wild things came leaping up to dance on the reflection of the stars, and over their heads as they danced the marsh lights rose and fell. The wild things are somewhat human in appearance, only all brown of skin and barely two feet high. Their ears are pointed like the squirrels, only far longer, and they leap to prodigious heights. They live all day under deep pools in the loneliest marshes, but at night they come up and dance. Each wild thing has over its head a marsh light, which moves as the wild thing moves. They have no souls and cannot die, and are the kith of the elf folk. All night they dance over the marshes, treading upon the reflection of the stars, for the surface of the bare water will not hold them by itself, but when the stars begin to pale, they sink down one by one into the pools of their home. Or if they tarry longer, sitting upon the rushes, their bodies fade from view as the marsh fires pale in the light, and by daylight none may see the wild things of the kith of the elf folk, neither may any see them even at night unless they were born, as I was, in the hour of dusk, just at the moment when the first star appears. Now, on the night that I tell of, a little wild thing had gone drifting over the waste, till it came right up to the walls of the cathedral, and danced upon the images of the colored saints as they lay in the water among the reflection of the stars. And as it leaped in its fantastic dance, it saw through the painted windows to where the people prayed, and heard the organ roaring over the marshes. The sound of the organ roared over the marshes, but the song and prayers of the people streamed up from the cathedral's highest tower like thin gold chains, and reached to paradise, and up and down them went the angels from paradise to the people, and from the people to paradise again. Then something akin to discontent troubled the wild thing for the first time since the making of the marshes, and the soft gray ooze and the chill of the deep water seemed to be not enough, nor the first arrival from the northwards of the tumultuous geese, nor the wild rejoicing of the wings of the wild fowl when every feather sings, nor the wonder of the calm ice that comes when the snipe depart and beards the rushes with frost and clothes the hushed waste with a mysterious haze where the sun goes red and low, nor even the dance of the wild things in the marvelous night, and the little wild thing longed to have a soul and to go and worship God. And when evensong was over and the lights were out, it went back crying to its kith. But on the next night, as soon as the images of the stars appeared in the water, it went leaping away from star to star to the farthest edge of the marshlands, where a great wood grew, where dwelt the oldest of the wild things. And it found the oldest of wild things sitting under a tree, sheltering itself from the moon. And the little wild thing said, I want to have a soul to worship God, 
and to know the meaning of music and to see the inner beauty of the marshlands and to imagine paradise. And the oldest of the wild things said to it, What have we to do with God? We are only wild things and of the kith of the elf folk. But it only answered, I want to have a soul. Then the oldest of the wild things said, I have no soul to give you, but if you got a soul, one day you would have to die, and if you knew the meaning of music, you would learn the meaning of sorrow, and it is better to be a wild thing and not to die. So it went weeping away. But they that were kin to the elf folk were sorry for the little wild thing, and though the wild things cannot sorrow long, having no souls to sorrow with, yet they felt for a while a soreness where their souls should be when they saw the grief of their comrade. So the kith of the elf folk went abroad by night to make a soul for the little wild thing, and they went over the marshes till they came to the high fields among the flowers and grasses. From there they gathered a large piece of gossamer that the spider had laid by twilight, and the dew was on it. Into this dew had shone all the lights of the long banks of the ribbed sky, as all the colors changed in the restful spaces of evening, and over it the marvelous night had gleamed with all its stars. Then the wild things went with their dew-bespangled gossamer down to the edge of their home, and there they gathered a piece of the gray mist that lies by night over the marshlands, and into it they put the melody of the waste that is borne up and down the marshes in the evening on the wings of the golden plover, and they put into it, too, the mournful song that the reeds are compelled to sing before the presence of the arrogant north wind. Then each of the wild things gave some treasured memory of the old marshes. For we can spare it, they said. And to all this they added a few images of the stars that they gathered out of the water. Still, the soul that the kith of the elf folk were making had no life. Then they put into it the low voices of two lovers that went walking into the night, wandering late alone, and after that they waited for the dawn. And the queenly dawn appeared, and the marsh lights of the wild things paled in the glare, and their bodies faded from view, and still they waited by the marsh's edge. And to them, waiting came over field and marsh, from the ground and out of the sky, the myriad song of the birds. This too the wild things put into the piece of haze that they had gathered in the marshlands, and wrapped it all up in their dew-bespangled gossamer. Then the soul lived. And there it lay in the hands of the wild things no larger than a hedgehog, and wonderful lights were in it, green and blue, and they changed ceaselessly, going round and round, and in the gray midst of it was a purple flare. And the next night they came to the little wild thing and showed her the gleaming soul, and they said to her, If you must have a soul, and go and worship God, and become a mortal and die. Place this to your left breast, a little above the heart, and it will enter and you will become a human. But if you take it, you can never be rid of it to become immortal again unless you pluck it out and give it to another. And we will not take it, and most of the humans have a soul already, and if you cannot find a human without a soul, you will one day die and your soul cannot go to paradise because it was only made in the marshes. Far away, the little wild thing saw the cathedral windows alight for evensong, and the song of the people mounting up to paradise and all the angels going up and down. So it bid farewell with tears and thanks to the wild things of the kith of the elf folk, and went leaping away towards the green dry land, holding the soul in its hands. And the wild things were sorry that it had gone, but could not be sorry long because they had no souls. At the marsh's edge, the little wild thing gazed for some moments over the water to where the marsh fires were leaping up and down, and then pressed the soul against its left breast a little above the heart. Instantly it became a young and beautiful woman who was cold and frightened. She clad herself somehow with bundles of reeds and went towards the lights of a house that stood close by, and she pushed open the door and entered and found a farmer and a farmer's wife sitting over their supper. And the farmer's wife took the little wild thing with the soul of the marshes up to her room, and clothed her and braided her hair, and brought her down again, and gave her the first food that she had ever eaten. Then the farmer's wife asked many questions. Where have you come from? she said. 
over the marshes. From what direction? said the farmer's wife. South, said the little wild thing with the new soul. But none can come over the marshes from the south, said the farmer's wife. No, they can't do that, said the farmer. I lived in the marshes. Who are you? asked the farmer's wife. I am a wild thing and have found a soul in the marshes, and we are kin to the elf folk. Talking it over afterwards, the farmer and his wife agreed that she must be a gypsy who had been lost, and that she was queer with hunger and exposure. So that night the little wild thing slept in the farmer's house, but her new soul stayed awake the whole night long, dreaming of the beauty of the marshes. As soon as dawn came over the waste and shone on the farmer's house, she looked from the window towards the glittering waters and saw the inner beauty of the marsh. For the wild things only love the marsh and know its haunts, but now she perceived the mystery of its distances and the glamour of its perilous pools with their fair and deadly mosses and felt the marvel of the north wind who comes dominant out of unknown icy lands and the wonder of that ebb and flow of life when the wild fowl whirl in at evening to the marshlands and at dawn pass out to sea. And she knew that over her head above the farmer's house stretched wide paradise where perhaps God was now imagining a sunrise while angels played low on lutes and the sun came rising up on the world below to gladden fields and marsh. And all that heaven thought, the marsh thought too, for the blue of the marsh was as the blue of heaven, and the great cloud shapes in heaven became the shapes in the marsh, and through each ran momentary rivers of purple, errant between banks of gold, and the stalwart army of reeds appeared out of the gloom with all their pennons waving as far as the eye could see, and from another window she saw the vast cathedral gathering its ponderous strength together and lifting it up in towers out of the marshlands. She said, I will never, never leave the marsh. An hour later, she dressed with great difficulty and went down to eat the second meal of her life. The farmer and his wife were kindly folk and taught her how to eat. I suppose the gypsies don't have knives and forks, one said to the other afterwards. After breakfast, the farmer went and saw the dean, who lived near his cathedral, and presently returned and brought back to the dean's house the little wild thing with the new soul. This is the lady, said the farmer. This is Dean Murnith. Then he went away. Ah, said the dean, I understand you were lost the other night in the marshes. It was a terrible night to be lost in the marshes. I love the marshes, said the little wild thing with the new soul. Indeed. How old are you? said the dean. I don't know, she answered. You must know about how old you are, he said. Oh, about ninety, she said, or more. Ninety years, exclaimed the dean. No, ninety centuries, she said. I am as old as the marshes. Then she told her story, how she had longed to be a human and go and worship God and have a soul and see the beauty of the world and how all the wild things had made her a soul of gossamer and mist and music and strange memories. But if this is true, said Dean Murnith, this is very wrong. God cannot have intended you to have a soul. What is your name? I have no name, she answered. We must find a Christian name and a surname for you. What would you like to be called? Song of the Rushes, she said. That won't do at all said the dean. Then I would like to be called Terrible North Wind, or Star in the Waters, she said. No, 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 said Dean Murnith. That is quite impossible. We would call you Miss Rush, if you like. How would Mary Rush do? Perhaps you had better have another name. Say, Mary Jane Rush. So the little wild thing with the soul of the marshes took the names that were offered her and became Mary Jane Rush. And we must find something for you to do, said Dean Murnith. Meanwhile, we can give you a room here. I don't want to do anything, replied Mary Jane. I want to worship God in the cathedral and live beside the marshes. Then Mrs. Murnith came in, and for the rest of that day, Mary Jane stayed at the house of the Dean. And there with her new soul, she perceived the beauty of the world, for it came gray and level out of misty distances and widened into grassy fields and plowlands right up to the edge of an old gabled town, and solitary in the fields far off an ancient windmill stood, 
and his honest handmade sails went round and round in the free East Anglian winds. Close by, the gabled houses leaned out over the streets, planted fair upon sturdy timbers that grew in the olden time, all glorying among themselves upon their beauty. And out of them, buttress by buttress, growing and going upwards, aspiring tower by tower, rose the cathedral. And she saw the people moving in the streets all leisurely and slow, and unseen among them, whispering to each other, unheard by living men, and concerned only with bygone things, drifted the ghosts of very long ago. And wherever the streets ran eastwards, wherever were gaps in the houses, always there broke into view the sight of the great marshes, like to some bar of music weird and strange that haunts a melody, arising again and again, played on the violin by one musician only, who plays no other bar, and he is swart and lank about the hair and bearded about the lips, and his mustache droops long and low, and no one knows the land from which he comes. All these were good things for a new soul to see. Then the sun set over fields and plowland, and the night came up. One by one the merry lights of cheery lamplit windows took their stations in the solemn night. Then the bells rang, far up in a cathedral tower, and their melody fell on the roofs of the old houses and poured over their eaves until the streets were full, and then flooded away over green fields and plow, till it came to the sturdy mill and brought the miller trudging to evensong, and far away eastwards and seawards the sound rang out over the remoter marshes, and it was all as yesterday to the old ghosts in the streets. Then the dean's wife took Mary Jane to evening service, and she saw three hundred candles filling all the aisle with light. But sturdy pillars stood there in unlit vastnesses, great colonnades going away into the gloom, where evening and morning, year in, year out, they did their work in the dark, holding the cathedral roof aloft. And it was stiller than the marshes are still when the ice has come, and the wind that brought it has fallen. Suddenly, into the stillness, rushed the sound of the organ, roaring, and presently the people prayed and sang. No longer could Mary Jane see their prayers ascending like thin gold chains, for that was but an elfin fancy, but she imagined clear in her new soul the seraphs passing in the ways of paradise and the angels changing guard to watch the world by night. When the dean had finished service, a young curate, Mr. Millings, went up into the pulpit. He spoke of Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, and Mary Jane was glad that there were rivers having such names, and heard with wonder of Nineveh, that great city, and many things strange and new. And the light of the candles shone on the curate's fair hair, and his voice went ringing down the aisle, and Mary Jane rejoiced that he was there. But when his voice stopped, she felt a sudden loneliness, such as she had not felt since the making of the marshes. For the wild things never are lonely and never unhappy, but dance all night on the reflection of the stars, and having no souls, desire nothing more. After the collection was made, before anyone moved to go, Mary Jane walked up the aisle to Mr. Millings. I love you, she said. Chapter 2 Nobody sympathized with Mary Jane. So unfortunate for Mr. Millings, everyone said. Such a promising young man. Mary Jane was sent away to a great manufacturing city of the Midlands, where work had been found for her in a cloth factory. And there was nothing in that town that was good for a soul to see, for it did not know that beauty was to be desired. So it made many things by machinery and became hurried in all its ways, and boasted its superiority over other cities, and became richer and richer, and there was none to pity it. In this city, Mary Jane had had lodgings found for her near the factory. At six o'clock on those November mornings, about the time that, far away from the city, the wildfowl rose up out of the calm marshes and passed to the troubled spaces of the sea, at six o'clock the factory uttered a prolonged howl and gathered the workers together, and there they worked, saving two hours for food, the whole of the daylit hours, and into the dark till the bells tolled six again. There Mary Jane worked with other girls in a long dreary room, where giants sat pounding wool into a long thread-like strip with iron rasping hands, and all day long they roared as they sat at their soulless work. But the work of Mary Jane was not with these, only their roar was ever in her ears as their clattering iron limbs went to and fro. Her work was to tend a creature smaller, but infinitely more cunning. 
It took the strip of wool that the giants had threshed and whirled it round and round until it had twisted it into a hard, thin thread. Then it would make a clutch with fingers of steel at the thread that it had gathered and waddle away about five yards and came back with more. It had mastered all the subtlety of skilled workers and had gradually displaced them. One thing only it could not do, it was unable to pick up the ends if a piece of the thread broke in order to tie them together again. For this a human soul was required and it was Mary Jane's business to pick up broken ends. And the moment she placed them together, the busy soulless creature tied them for itself. All here was ugly. Even the green wool as it whirled round and round was neither the green of the grass nor yet the green of the rushes, but a sorry, muddy green that befitted a sullen city under a murky sky. And when she looked out over the roofs of the town, there too was ugliness, and well the houses knew it, for with hideous stucco they aped in grotesque mimicry the pillars and temple of old Greece, pretending to one another to be that which they were not. And emerging from these houses and going in, and seeing the pretense of paint and stucco year after year until it all peeled away, the souls of the poor owners of those houses sought to be other souls until they grew weary of it. At evening, Mary Jane went back to her lodgings. Only then, after the dark had fallen, could the soul of Mary Jane perceive any beauty in that city, when the lamps were lit and here and there a star shone through the smoke. Then she would have gone abroad and beheld the night. But this the old woman to whom she was confided would not let her do. And the days multiplied themselves by seven and became weeks, and the weeks passed by and all days were the same. And all the while the soul of Mary Jane was crying for beautiful things and found not one, saving on Sundays when she went to church and left it to find the city grayer than before. One day she decided that it was better to be a wild thing in the lovely marshes than to have a soul that cried for beautiful things and found not one. From that day she determined to be rid of her soul, so she told her story to one of the factory girls and said to her, The other girls are poorly clad and they do soulless work. Surely some of them have no souls and would take mine. But the factory girl said to her, All the poor have souls, it is all they have. Then Mary Jane watched the rich whenever she saw them, and vainly sought for someone without a soul. One day at the hour when the machines rested, and the human beings that tended them rested too, the wind being at that time from the direction of the marshlands, the soul of Mary Jane lamented bitterly. Then as she stood outside the factory gates, the soul irresistibly compelled her to sing, and a wild song came from her lips, hymning the marshlands. And into her song came crying her yearning for home, and for the sound of the shout of the north wind, masterful and proud, with his lovely lady, the snow. And she sang of tales that the rushes murmured to one another, tales that the teal knew, and the watchful heron. And over the crowded streets her song went crying away, the song of waste places, and of wild free lands, full of wonder and magic. For she had in her elf-made soul the song of the birds, and the roar of the organ in the marshes. At this moment, Signor Tamzoni, the well-known English tenor, happened to go by with a friend. They stopped and listened. Everyone stopped and listened. There has been nothing like this in Europe in my time, said Signor Tamsoni. So a change came into the life of Mary Jane. People were written to, and finally it was arranged that she should take a leading part in the Convent Garden Opera in a few weeks. So she went to London to learn. London and singing lessons were better than the city of the Midlands and those terrible machines. Yet still, Mary Jane was not free to go and live as she liked by the edge of the marshlands, and she was still determined to be rid of her soul, but could find no one that had not a soul of their own. One day, she was told that the English people would not listen to her as Miss Rush, and was asked what more suitable name she would like to be called by. I would like to be called Terrible North Wind, said Mary Jane or Song of the Rushes. When she was told that this was impossible and Signorina Maria Russiano was suggested, she acquiesced at once, as she had acquiesced when they took her away from her curate. She knew nothing of the ways of humans. At last, the day of the opera came round, and it was a cold day of the winter, and Signorina Russiano appeared on the stage before a crowded house, and Signorina Russiano sang. 
and into the song went all the longing of her soul, the soul that could not go to paradise, but could only worship God and know the meaning of music, and the longing pervaded that Italian song as the infinite mystery of the hills is borne along the sound of distant sheep bells. Then, in the souls that were in that crowded house, arose little memories of a great while, since that were quite, quite dead, and lived a while again during that marvelous song. And a strange chill went into the blood of all that listened, as though they stood on the border of bleak marshes, and the north wind blew. And some it moved to sorrow, and some to regret, and some to an unearthly joy. Then suddenly the song went wailing away like the winds of the winter from the marshlands when spring appears from the south. So it ended, and a great silence fell fog-like over all that house, breaking in upon the end of a chatty conversation that Cecilia, Countess of Birmingham, was enjoying with a friend. In the dead hush, Signorina Russiano rushed from the stage. She appeared again, running among the audience, and dashed up to Lady Birmingham. "'Take my soul,' she said. "'It is a beautiful soul. It can worship God and knows the meaning of music and can imagine paradise. And if you go to the marshlands with it, you will see beautiful things. There is an old town there, built of lovely timbers with ghosts in its streets.' Lady Birmingham stared. Everyone was standing up. See, si, said Signorina Russiano, it is a beautiful soul. And she clutched at her left breast a little above the heart, and there was the soul shining in her hand, with the green and blue lights going round and round, and the purple flare in the midst. Take it, she said, and you will love all that is beautiful and know the four winds, each one by his name, and the songs of the birds at dawn. I do not want it, because I am not free. Put it to your left breast a little above the heart. Still everybody was standing up, and Lady Birmingham felt uncomfortable. Please offer it to someone else, she said. But they all have souls already, said Signorina Russiano. And everybody went on standing up, and Lady Birmingham took the soul in her hand. Perhaps it is lucky, she said. She felt that she wanted to pray. She half closed her eyes and said, Unberufen! And she put the soul to her left breast a little above the heart and hoped that the people would sit down and the singer go away. Instantly, a heap of clothes collapsed before her. For a moment, in the shadow among the seats, those who were born in the dusk hour might have seen a little brown thing leaping free from the clothes. Then it sprang into the bright light of the hall and became invisible to any human eye. It dashed about for a little, then found the door, and presently was in the lamplit streets. To those that were born in the dusk hour, it might have been seen leaping rapidly wherever the streets ran northwards and eastwards, disappearing from human sight as it passed under the lamps and appearing again beyond them with a marsh light over its head. Once a dog perceived it and gave chase and was left far behind. The cats of London, who are all born in the dusk hour, howled fearfully as it went by. Presently it came to the meaner streets, where the houses are smaller. Then it went due north eastwards, leaping from roof to roof. And so in a few minutes it came to more open spaces, and then to the desolate lands where market gardens grow, which are neither town nor country, till at last the good black trees came into view with their demoniac shapes in the night, and the grass was cold and wet, and the night mist floated over it and a great white owl came by, going up and down in the dark. And at all these things, the little wild thing rejoiced elvishly. And it left London far behind, reddening the sky, and could distinguish no longer its unlovely roar, but heard again the noises of the night. And now it would come through a hamlet glowing and comfortable in the night, and now to the dark, wet, open fields again. And many an owl it overtook as they drifted through the night, a people friendly to the elf folk. Sometimes it crossed wide rivers, leaping from star to star, and, choosing its way as it went to avoid the hard rough roads, came before midnight to the East Anglian lands, and it heard there the shout of the North Wind, who was dominant and angry as he drove southwards his adventurous geese, while the rushes bent before him, chanting plaintively and low, like enslaved roars of some fabulous trireme, bending and swinging under blows of the lash, and singing all the while a doleful song. And it felt the good dank air that clothed by night the broad East Anglian lands, 
and came again to some old perilous pool where the soft green mosses grew. And there it plunged, downward and downward, into the dear dark water till it felt the homely ooze once more coming up between its toes. Thence, out of the lovely chill that is in the heart of the ooze, it arose renewed and rejoicing to dance upon the image of the stars. I chanced to stand that night by the marsh's edge, forgetting in my mind the affairs of men. And I saw the marsh fires come leaping up from all the perilous places, and they came up by flocks the whole night long to the number of a great multitude, and danced away together over the marshes. And I believe that there was a great rejoicing all that night among the kith of the elf folk.